Castle Fortress, the town of London. This is World Heritage Site. Uh, I'm Yeoman Warder and Mary, one of 37 Yeoman Warders who have the honour and the privilege to not only work here, uh, but I also live here, which is uh, so you're very welcome to my home. Before we go on, I'll just tell you a little bit about ourselves, um, which is also a good place to start. Yeoman Warders, or Beef Eaters, as you probably know, as we've seen a lot of here. Um, Beef Eaters is actually a derogatory term, and it's a, it's a term that we, uh, we don't love, but it's one we're stuck with. Uh, Yeoman Warders are the Royal Council of Warders in the town of London, and Yeoman Warders are the next door. Beef Eaters is a lot easier to say. Uh, we've been here, there's a couple of to say we've been here since 1326, the year 1326. Mark, we our birthday to be the 22nd of August 1485. On that day, a young man called Henry Tudor defeated another young man called King Richard III at the Battle of Bosworth <coughs> Field. Uh, 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 that's the shit. Uh, uh, Henry discovered the crown of England underneath the bush, he stuck it on his own head, and he had himself proclaimed King Henry VII. And in the seventh, he turned around to his soldiers, his common soldiers, not his knights, and said, You lads are coming with me to London. You're going to guard the Tower of London, and you're going to guard me. Here we are, 530 years later, doing that exact same thing. We're the guardians and custodians of this ancient royal palace and fortress. Never forget that this is a royal palace. If you were in Buckingham Palace now, you'd be in no more of a royal palace than what you're now standing. Um, we are also the guardians and custodians of its ancient history and its tradition. We're responsible for its safety and for its security, so your, your safety and your security, therefore. And we are also the Majesty the Queen's personal ceremonial bodyguards. When we do that, uh, uh, when we fulfil those functions, we wear a very different uniform. Some of you hopefully have seen this. If you've got maps, it's certainly not like that. Uh, we wear a different hat. It's got red, white, and blue ribbons around here. It's made of black velvet. We wear a white ruff around our neck. It's a truly important change since the time. A scarlet and gold tunic. This is £15,000 worth of tunic. This is tailor made, all the gold on it is real gold thread. Um, we wear trousers just down below my knees and we wear the tights. So I'm just quite like that. They're <laughs> <laughs> man tights. I'll uh, leave that to your own imagination. They're not quite the same as lady tights. So I'll leave that to you to think about. We also carry a sword uh, and we wear, uh, or we carry a thing called a partisan, which is essentially an eight foot spear. We've got that there. I've seen some of you on that yet. Just hold <laughs> there we go, so yeah. So this is the uniform I'm talking about, which is the top up there. You, you would have seen that. Um, we are also very, very honoured in that we are amongst the very few people in this world that can walk in front of the Majesty of Queen with our backs turned to her and we can also carry weapons in her presence. We are the Majesty of Queen's person, so we are not at all nice. Um, there are 37 of us, this really is my home, this is where I live. I live here with my wife and my children. Uh, some of the lads have got cats and dogs, everybody's got mice. <laughs> um, uh, and it's a job for life. We stay here till about 60, 65. We can stay a little bit longer. We're still physically able to get up and down on these, uh, on these benches. Uh, and we don't have to stay here if we don't want to. We do have electricity running water. I've been asked that before. Uh, it's a fantastic line. Now, to put that into perspective, since 1969, 536 people have been in space. There's only ever been 402 of us now. So, more people have been space than really before this year. simple indeed. All you need to do is a minimum of 22 years service in Her Majesty's Armed Forces. I spent 25 years as a Royal Marines Commander. We all have to be, I thought that kind of started out in the places. We also have to be warrant officers, sergeant majors, and we also have to be long service and good conduct men. This does not mean we would be a Steps are turned left and went up. You can see it's 
see a little bit of it over there. Look, just there's some kind of bus wood there. And it continued up through to the train station. If you'll get to the train station, the Tower Hill tube station. Chose that site just inside this eastern city wall where the Roman fort once stood to build this building here. And he built it in 1078. 1078 took 20 years to build. Um, 92 feet tall. Um, the walls are taken, I think they said 15 feet at the bottom and 11 feet at the top. On each corner you can see a turret. This one, this one, and the one around there are square, and the one around that side and the northeast corner uh, are round. Um, on top of each turret you can see a crown in gold leaf beneath which is a weather vane, and these bear the royal standard, and this denotes that this is still, as I said before, a royal palace to this day. All of our kings and queens lived in that building for over several, almost 600 years. The last one to do so was King James the first, and he left here in 1603. Uh, the royal family lived on the top floor. The floor below was a council chamber and a banquet hall, accommodation for knights and ladies, uh, and it's both a chapel royal of St. John the Evangelist. This is the only surviving Roman church in this country. And it's one of the two royal churches we have here in town. The floor below is occupied by servants and retainers, and there is, of course, one more floor partly below there. Now, the River Thames used to wash up to about where we stood now in those days, so that made that floor, the one below the ground, daft up and cold. And that made it the perfect place to be. Prisoners.
Ravens, there are, uh, we've got seven Ravens here. Uh, there was an ancient Celtic legend, well, there is an ancient, ancient Celtic legend that says those Ravens never leave this site. That building will crumble to dust. The monarchy will fall, and therefore this country will fall. Uh, King Charles II was aware of this, uh, of this legend, and so in 1665 he decreed that we must keep six Ravens here at the town of Lennon to avoid the disaster that had just spoken about right there. Uh, now that does sound a bit ridiculous, I think, in the 21st century, which is why we've got seven. <laughs> we did have eight, uh, uh, but three weeks ago I think it was, one of them died. Uh, they haven't replaced it yet just because the sun is coming in, it'd be too, there'd be too much madness here to introduce a new baby, so we'll be down to seven at the moment. Um, the reason they're kept in the cages at the moment is, is because of all the building work that's going on here. It's also mating season and they've all gone a little bit mad. Um, but primarily the, the, the building work that's here upsets them, so they're kept in, in those cages at night. They're put into these cages here, and that's their night cages. They normally run free around, they, they normally roam. We trim their wings, this stops them flying away. Uh, it's not cruel, it's the same as me and you having a haircut. Uh, it grows back, the, the, the feathers grow back. It, it, it is they live here to about 36 uh, years old. The oldest is probably yeah, about 40. standing in the outer ward of the Tower of London. That's the inner wall there behind you. It dates from around 1220. Um, the, it was built by King Edward III, and it's 50 feet high. The outer wall here dates from 1280, 1285. It was built by Henry III's son, King Edward I. This is 28 feet thick in places. Now, up until 1275, when they started to build this wall, we'd all be swimming in the River Thames now. The River Thames used to wash against the base of the inner wall there behind you. When they started to build this wall, they pushed the tent back and they raised the roadway some 12 feet to the level of the now. <coughs> the gate behind me is the world famous Traitor's Gate. This was also built during the reign of King Edward I. Um, and rather than use the narrow and twisting streets of London, where convoys could be attacked or stores stolen, prisoners set free, that sort of thing, he decided to use the River Thames as a highway. So at high tide, he could pass through those gates and land here at these steps. And so this gate was originally known as the Water Gate. <laughs> well, having breached that out defensive wall, he realised that he weakened the defences of the town. So he commanded that this tower be built above the gate in order to defend it. It's named in honour of a former constable of the town, St. Thomas the Beckett, Archbishop of Canterbury. He was murdered on the steps of Canterbury Cathedral on the 29th of December 1117. This was on the orders of Edward's great grandfather, King Henry II. Uh, right, so in there, if you're going to have a walk around later, that's the medieval palace inside there. Uh, it was King Edward I's um, uh, apartments. Behind you is the Wakefield Town, the one where they found, uh, or where those two bodies were buried beneath the step, uh, beneath the rubble. Wakefield Town was where the crown jewels were held until 1967. All official records and papers of the kings and queens' courts were stored in there, and it was also the scene of a murder. King Henry VI was stabbed to death in the back while at prayer inside that building on the 21st of May, 1470. Uh, there's the bloody tower. We've spoken about the bloody tower already. You can see a portcullis hanging down there, the spiky bit. Um, that's one of two portcullises we have here. It dates from the uh, 1300s and it weighs two and a half tons and it's still in full working order. Obviously, Errol Flynn will have you believe that a man in tight will have to hold that up with one hand <laughs> or fight it off the baddies with the other. But that's not true. It used to take 30 men to raise and lower that. They were put there also by the Duke of Wellington, and uh, they were to stop his sentries from hiding in the corners there, having to keep smoking in the dust. You can also see a metal ring. As we go through, you'll see a metal ring in the wall there. That was where they used to tie up boats. The, it's really was the River Thames, so that's literally that's the original ring, and they used to tie up their boats along there uh, before entering the tower through the bloody tower. Right, so we've got this, and this time we will talk about death. Green, this is the village green of the Tower of London. So most village greens in this country got cricket pitches, swings or slides, or a nice little pub. We've got something quite unique, our like very own execution site. There it is behind you. <laughs> that glass coffee table with a ridiculous pillow on it really is where people lost their lives. I don't like modern art. I think that's ridiculous. I'm sure most of you agree with that, but there we go. Um, that's not to be confused with a public scaffold, which is up on Tower Hill. 
125 men of noble birth were executed up on Tower Hill. Only six people were executed here. Three of them were queens of England. Before I tell you about those, I'll just quickly describe us, uh, the buildings that surround us here. We've already spoken about the White Tower. Behind us, or uh, behind me rather, in front of you, is the Bloody Tower. That one just in the corner there. And then just here in the corner, or this corner, is a nice photograph. That is a photograph, believe it or not. It's a very, very good photograph, and it is exactly what the building behind it looks like. That building is the Queen's House. Uh, it's a 500-year-old building, and so, uh, as, as such, the roof leaks. They're taking the, well, they took the roof off. They're having a look at how the house was put together. They're going to put the roof back on. Hopefully, it's not going to leak anymore. And then they'll take all the scaffolding away from the photograph so that you guys can see exactly what's behind it, so you're not missing out, because it's a bit boring than the scaffold. Um, well, the house dates from around 1540. I say around, because we can now precisely date it, because they dendrochronologically dated the wooden beams in the, in the ceiling there, or in the roof, rather. Um, and they, those beams were cut down in the, between the winter of 1537 and the summer of 1538 and then they would have built the building almost immediately after that. So that was built during the year 1538 to 1539. Precisely um, Now it's said that it was built for Queen Anne Boleyn but she was dead in 1536 before they'd even cut the beams down so that, that can't be true. Um, Say it is the Queen's House. It's the best preserved Tudor building in the city of London. All of the others were destroyed during the Great Fire of London of 1666. So you will not find any building like this anywhere in London. Um, it's the Queen's House. The Queen has never stayed in it and she will never stay in it. it but this is a royal palace and the Queen needs a residence inside this royal palace. It is the Queen, however, of the General the Lord Dammit. He's the current constable. Taken to Nuremberg, he was tried, convicted, and sentenced to life in prison. And he served that prison sentence in Spandau Prison in Berlin, where he died in 1987. Now, I realise for the Americans here that was a little bit confusing because I just said the war was on in 1940 and 41. I know your history books teach you it started a little bit later than that, but it did in fact start in 1939. But it has been the source of endless films about how you won the war for us. So thank you very much indeed. <laughs> their date from a slightly later period and they now serve as accommodation for some of my Yeoman Warden colleagues and their families. This really is where we live. That building there, uh, that is uh, that is the Tower. Tower. Uh, that used to be the state prison. There are 91 inscriptions in there carved into the walls by the prisoners. And some of these date back more than 450 years. They're absolutely, it doesn't say Eric was here. They were beautiful family crests and stuff like that. Really, really nice. So go and have a look at those if you get the opportunity. Um, and then behind you is, uh, or in fact, sorry, before we go there, there's the doctor's house there, look, the tall skinny one, then the vicar's house. Um, he's got an awesome job. He gets all of August off every single year. He works one day a week, and that is as far as he has to walk to work. It's not a bad job, is it? Uh, and that's his office here, the Chapel Royal of St. Peter at Vincula. That's the second royal church we've got here, and I'll talk about that very, very shortly. The big building over there, one with the clock, um, that is the Waterloo Block, named in honour of uh, the 
launching from Wellington's victory over the French in 1815. Uh, it was built as a, as a barracks for a thousand soldiers of the Tower Garrison. Nowadays, though, that is where the crown jewels are stored. I'm going to go in there shortly and see those. There are over 11 and a half tons of gold and 23,000 diamonds, rubies, emeralds, and God knows what, all inside that building. The two largest cut diamonds in the world are inside there, one of which is 530. 0.2 carats. It's massive. And yes, they are all real. Nothing here at the Tower of London is fake. They are very, very much real diamonds in there. Those are real soldiers as well. Nothing here is. Right, let's talk about the church very quickly. That is the Chapel Royal on St. Peter's at Vinkleburn. As I say, it's one of two royal churches that we have here at the Tower of London. They are also royal peculiar churches. There's five royal peculiar churches. The royal peculiar church is a church that exists purely for the spiritual needs of the monarch. That is quite literally one of the Queen's personal churches, as is the one inside the White Tower. The other three, uh, there's two at St James's Palace and there's one at Hampton Court Palace. Very beautiful churches indeed. Um, there's been a church there since the year 1105. That was pulled down by King Edward I and rebuilt in 1287. That was destroyed by a fire in 1514 and the current church was built in 1519 during the reign of King Henry VIII. Um, it's original Tudor, all of it is original Tudor architecture. In 50, oh, the, as I said before, the royal family left here in 1603, so unfortunately the church was allowed to fall into a state of disrepair. In 1876, Queen Victoria ordered a commission to go in there and restore it back to its original um, Tudor uh, condition. When they went in there, they found the floor was very uneven because many of the tombs below had collapsed. So they uh, dug up the floor and they found 1,500 bodies under there, oh. many of whom didn't have their heads. There are one that was executed up on Tower Hill and here was, was buried inside the church there. Um, so they gathered all these bones together, there was no DNA as I said before, and they put them into two large metal boxes and they took them through into the crypt where they put them into the wall and they bricked up the wall. They were then given a religious service. If you were executed up on Tower Hill or in here, when you were buried you were, you were a traitor. So you were simply thrown into the ground no religious service was said above you, no friends or family to mourn your loss, and there certainly wasn't a marker to mark the site of your, <coughs> your uh, final resting place. So when the bones were reinterred, they were then given a religious service, but there is still no marker to record the site of their final resting place. Among those bones are two saints, St. Saint Thomas More and St. John Fisher. Anyone who watched Wolf Hall on the TV will, uh, will know about Thomas Cromwell. He's also buried through there, uh, and there's a lot of other roads and wretches from English history buried in, inside that church. The other... The other ones uh, that, that you're going to be interested in are the three queens of England buried in there. They were all executed behind you on that spot there. The first one was on the 19th of May, 1536. This was Queen Anne Boleyn. Now, Anne Boleyn was executed, or tried rather, for um, incest, adultery and witchcraft. Make of those what you will. She was actually tried down there. When we first stood by the raven's cages, they used to stand a big hall. And it was in that hall that Anne Boleyn was tried. Um, she feared the block and acts greatly. It didn't always go very well. The executions were notoriously bad at chopping people's heads off. It didn't often take one stroke. It used to take five or six. So it's quite a, quite a grisly way to die. So she feared that greatly, and so she elected to be executed in the French manner. And the French manner in those days was with a two-handed, double-edged sword. And they couldn't find a skilled Frenchman. <laughs> Probably still looking, if we're all honest. <laughs> So they sent off to Calais for a man with the necessary skills. And he, they sent off for him, his name, this is absolutely true, his name was Rambo. <laughs> Spelled B-O-U-X, I think, at the end. So it wasn't the Johnny Rambo, as we see on the time, but his name was quite, quite obviously, uh, his name was sorry, quite literally Rambo. Anyway, they sent off for him seven days before Anne's trial had even started. So it doesn't take much working out, she was going to die, no matter what the outcome of that trial. On the day of her execution, there would have been a wooden platform just there. It was covered in straw. The straw was to soak up the blood, but also to conceal the, um, the sword. She got up onto that platform and she delivered her final speech. And she started to pray, Lord, have mercy on my pitiful soul. The executioner then distracted her. He shouted, bring me my sword. This made Anne look up, which put her neck in the perfect position. But he'd already got the sword in his hand. And he used it to take off her head so quickly and so cleanly that when he held up her head, this was a point of law, he had to demonstrate that justice had been carried out. He held her head up for the assembled uh, people to see, uh, and he, um, it said that for 27 seconds after the head was removed from the shoulders, that the eyes were still looking around the crowd and that her lips were still moving in prayer. That's a documented fact, and it's very, very nasty indeed. She's buried inside the church there. Uh, 
The next person to die here was a lady called uh, Margaret Pole. Margaret Pole was a Countess of Salisbury and she was the last of the Plantagenet princesses. Now Margaret Pole had done absolutely nothing wrong, neither was she afforded the luxury of a trial. Fortunately for her, her son, Cardinal Reginald Pole, who was a Catholic cardinal, was in Rome. And he was preaching against King Henry VIII. Henry VIII didn't like this very much, obviously, but there was nothing he could do about it. So the son, anyway, so he arrested the mother. He had her brought here and he had her executed. She was 67 years old and she refused to lay a neck on the block. She was a game old bird and she said, that is for traitors, I am not such. And she stood up and she ran off down there towards the bloody tower. She was chased by the executioner, who was much more lively on his feet than she was, uh, and his assistant. The assistant held her down and 13 blows of the axe later, she stopped wriggling around. He hacked her to death. The bits of her were buried also in the church. Just to her hand, but it is very uh, the following year, there was an unusual event here. Two people were executed, one immediately after the other. What made that even more unusual was the fact that they were both ladies, and even more unusual, one of them was a queen. This is Queen Catherine now. Catherine was executed for her associations with other men, both before and during her marriage to King Henry VIII. But it was to be her affair with a man called Thomas Culpepper, which was to be her undoing. He was a gentleman of her court. On the scaffold just there, she said to the executioner, I die the Queen of England, but I would rather die the wife of the only man I ever loved, Thomas Culpepper. Now, girls, isn't that romantic? Love, isn't yeah. <laughs> Thomas Culpepper didn't think so, because he was stood in the crowd. Like that. What are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> he was immediately arrested. Two months later, he was hand-drawn and quartered at Tyburn, which is now where Marble Arch stands, at the western end of, of uh, Oxford Street. That's how much she loved it. Um, <laughs> They took the straw away, it was covered in her blood, they wiped the blade down, they put some fresh straw down, and they brought out a young lady called Jane Boleyn. Jane Boleyn was the Viscountess of Rochford, she was also Lady Jane, uh, what am I talking about? She was, um, she was Catherine Howard's lady in waiting, I'm sorry. Uh, she was the sister-in-law of Anne Boleyn, she was actually married to Anne's brother George. Remember Anne was executed for incest, that kind of involves your brother. Her brother George is also buried inside the church, <laughs> as a result of the same thing. So poor old Jane Boleyn was brought out here and she was executed immediately after her mistress. Her crime was that she knew about these affairs but she neglected to tell the king about them. Both of those ladies are buried inside the church. Captain Howe is buried right next door to uh, Anne Boleyn. All was quiet here for 12 years then in terms of killing queens anyway when it was the turn of a young lady called Lady Jane Grey. Lady Jane Grey was 16 years old and she was the uncrowned queen of this country for just nine days. Now after the death of her cousin, King Edward VI, he was the only surviving son of King Henry VIII, um, she was woken from her bed at Sion House, which is down the river in that direction, uh, just out near Twickenham. She was brought here by barge, taken into the White Tower and told you were now the Queen of England. She was sat on a throne, had a crown thrust upon her head. She didn't want to be the Queen of England. She knew it wasn't hers to, it wasn't her throne to have. The rightful heir to the throne in many people's eyes was a lady called Mary Tudor. Queen Mary, or Bloody Mary, as she became known. She was the eldest child of King Henry VIII. Now, Mary was at large in East Anglia. She managed to evade the armies that were sent to capture her, and she got into London. Now, the people that sent that army was a man called John Dudley, the Duke of Northumberland. John Dudley was a very ambitious man. On the deathbed of, of King Edward VI, he persuaded the king to sign a piece of paper to say that Jane Grey should be his successor. This isn't as mad as it sounds. Jane Grey was the great-granddaughter of King Henry VII and the grand-niece of King Henry VIII, so she very much had royal blood. Uh, so the young king agreed to do that before he died, so this is why Jane Grey was born here. The Duke of Northumberland also called Jane Grey to marry his son, uh, Guildford Dudley, um, and this was so that his daughter-in-law, who, who was now queen, he could exert more, more influence over her, and therefore he would have more power over the country. As I said, Mary then got back to London. She persuaded the Privy Council that she was J in the English language in those days, and it's, it's been attributed to her husband, Gilbert Dudley. He was 19 years old. The Duke of Northumberland was also arrested. He was tried within two months, and at his trial, he exonerated Jane and Gilbert Dudley of all involvement in this plot. It didn't do anybody any good. The Duke was duly executed. He was, uh, he was uh, beheaded, and he's also buried inside the church there. Nine months later, Jane Grey was looking out of those windows there when she saw a young husband being dragged from this tower on his way up to Tower Hill. An hour later, she saw his headless body brought up those stairs and into the church there for burial. 
If that's not anguish enough for a 16-year-old girl, she must have seen the carpenters knocking up the scaffold for her own execution just over there on the same day, which was the 12th of February, 1554. Now, I think that's a truly tragic story. Everyone who comes here wants to know about Anne Boleyn. Where was Anne Boleyn buried? Where was Anne Boleyn beheaded? Where was Anne Boleyn tried? Anne Boleyn, Anne Boleyn, Anne Boleyn, Anne Boleyn. <laughs> Everybody wants to know about Anne Boleyn, but nobody ever asks about this 16-year-old girl who had absolutely no idea why on cold February morning she was kneeling over there in front of a man with a massive axe about to lose her head. She had no clue. It's a really, really sad story. I urge you to read up on her. She's a remarkable young lady. And that is the stories of all the executions. Well, not all the executions. Uh, a number of other executions here. Uh, as an example, three Scottish soldiers were executed over there by the left-hand side of the uh, church there. Three Scottish soldiers in 1743 were shot. They were brought here because they thought they were being reviewed by the king, King uh, George II at the time. Uh, but uh, that, was, that wasn't true. They were told that they were going off to fight somewhere they didn't want to, so they rebelled. They arrested the hundred re uh, rebellious Scottish soldiers, they put all their names in a hat, they pulled three of them out and they shot them over there as a lesson to the rest to be able to and that's, yeah. Okay guys, so, is, that, is there any questions before you disappear and look at the crown jewels? No. no. Everyone happy? Yeah. yeah. Right, thank, thank you very, very much, much indeed. Thank you. You're very welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.